Merci. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. As the director of IRASEC, I'm delighted to welcome you to our two roundtables under the heading of multidimensional approaches to the new regional order, views from Asia and the European Union. I also warmly extend my gratitude to all participants, researchers, diplomats, and other practitioners in the field, as well as my team at IRASEC, Christine Cabasset and Eric Frecon, for their contribution. After the welcome speech and the overview speeches, uh, we will hear the two roundtables, the first one on maritime security and the second one on environmental issues. Without further ado, I invite His Excellency Thierry Matou, Ambassador of France to Thailand, to deliver his welcome speech. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Merci, thank you. So distinguished guests, academics, fellow diplomats, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, Saudi Cap. Bonjour. Four years ago, on uh, May the 2nd, 2018, actually it's quite an anniversary today, France launched an uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy with, in mind, four ideas. First, it was important for us to remind that we belong to this region where we have territories and overseas communities which allow us to be actors and not only observers. Second, the Indo-Pacific has become a global strategic center of gravity with several tensions because of a growing number of geopolitical, security, environmental, and trade challenges. We felt the need to strengthen our partnerships in the region. Third, this region is having to act urgently to address global issues such as climate change, biodiversity erosion and health issues, among others. So we are keen to take action along with our Indo-Pacific partners through concrete projects to propose solutions to those challenges. Last but not least, we wanted to offer an alternative to bipolarity. Our vision of Indo-Pacific is focused on an objective of stability and development alongside our European partners, we have been insisting on the need of an inclusive approach, but without being naive about the reality of a geopolitical situation. In the context of the war in Ukraine, which is definitely not a European issue, but a worldwide challenge with multiple implications in the Indo-Pacific region, we feel even more the need of a robust involvement in the Indo-Pacific region to work together for the sake of peace and development. Following France, other European countries like Germany and the Netherlands have coined their own national Indo-Pacific strategy. Eventually, the EU itself came out with an EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific which was formally presented as, as a joint communication by the Commission and the High Representative on 16 September last year. Two months ago, on the 22nd of February, the French Presidency of the Council of European Union, together with the European Commission and the High Representative, co-organized in Paris a ministerial forum for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. This was the occasion to bring together the European institution and representatives of nearly 60 countries, half from the EU and half from the Indo-Pacific region. On that occasion, all participants reaffirmed their commitment to a rule-based international order, democratic values and principles, and multilateralism to promote the development of a region and to strengthen its ties with the EU through cooperation in exchanges in different fields. It was also the occasion to start to propose the solution I was talking about. This forum was also the occasion to emphasize the specific place of Southeast Asia within the Indo-Pacific. This region, which the French historian and anthropologist Paul Meurs called the corner of Asia, where the Indian and the Chinese words meet is in fact much more than that. 
Not only does it have its own genius, of which ASEAN is the regional institutional expression, but it's also, it's also the locus of exchanges and the essential bridge between the African, the Middle Eastern, Asian, and Pacific spaces. So two months after this forum, which was organized just the day before Russia started to invade Ukraine, and in the new political strategic context resulting from this war, today's seminar provides an opportunity to review the results of the forum, as well as to exchange insights related to two of the topics discussed during the forum, namely security on the oceans and environmental issues. In both cases, the range of issues is very broad, whether it's a question of security between states or involving non-state actors, or in the case of climate change, illegal fishing or plastic pollution, for example. The objective here is to cross-reference the approaches of state actors in charge of these issues, diplomats and military, with those of researchers in order to broaden the perspective and foster a dialogue that we hope to be open, sharp, and fruitful. I'm very happy to open this seminar with my good friend, Ambassador David Daly, as the articulation between French and the EU strategies are key in this region. I would like to address a special thank to Ambassador Christophe Penot, the French ambassador for the Indo-Pacific, and to Ambassador Gabriele Vincentin, the special envoy of the European Union for the Indo-Pacific for being here with us. Their contribution and input will be essential to launch our debate. I also want to thank the IRASEC team for organizing this event. And last but not least, the 12 participants in the round tables, Jean-Marie Jean Mathuré, Joint Commander of the French Armed Forces in the Asia Pacific, and all the distinguished researchers who agreed to share their time and ideas, whether from India, Indonesia, Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, France, and the European Union. Once again, this simple enumeration reflects both the geographical extension of the Indo-Pacific region and the central position that Southeast Asia region holds within it. I wish you a good seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I next invite His Excellency David Bailey, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the European Union to the Kingdom of Thailand to deliver his welcome speech. Your Excellency, please. Excellencies, distinguished academics, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for also giving me the opportunity to uh, say a few words. While the EU Indo-Pacific strategy is new, the European Union is not starting from zero in this region. The EU and its member states have a long history with and in the Indo-Pacific region. We have been significantly contributing to development, to open trade, to tackling, tackling global problems such as climate change and sustainable development, and to helping to uphold international law, including in areas such as freedom of navigation and human rights. Nonetheless, the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific sends out three clear political messages. Firstly, recognition. The EU is recognizing the importance of the Indo-Pacific region. Secondly, it is a statement of intent. It is the EU outlining its priority areas in the Indo-Pacific and stating its policy responses in a coherent and comprehensive way, and also outlining the basic principles underlying the EU approach. Thirdly, it is an invitation. It is the EU inviting cooperation from the countries of the Indo-Pacific 
on issues of shared interests, to cooperate wherever we can, to protect whenever we must. Today, as Ambassador Mathieu already mentioned, today we see the international rules-based system being attacked by Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war of aggression against Ukraine. This is an attack against all countries which wish to live by negotiation, by agreed rules, by multilateralism. The international system, which both Thailand and the EU strongly believe in. Since this is an attack against all of us, the war even reinforces the importance of our EU Indo-Pacific strategy. I look forward to hearing the various presentations today, including from the French ambassador for the Indo-Pacific, His Excellency Monsieur Christophe Penot, and of course, from our EU special envoy for the Indo-Pacific, His Excellency Gabriele Vizintini. Before I finish, could I just point out the old saying that success has many fathers. We are very fortunate to have in Bangkok His Excellency Thierry Matou, the ambassador of France to Thailand. I know he was a prime motor in Paris behind the development of the French Indo-Pacific strategy, and similarly behind the development of the EU Indo-Pacific strategy in Brussels. I wish to thank him and his colleagues for organizing this very valuable event, which is itself a follow-up to the important ministerial forum for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific held in Paris in January. I very much look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much. His Excellency Ambassador um, David Belli, uh, thank you a lot for uh, your welcome and introductory, as well as the, the speech from uh, Ambassador uh, Thierry Matou, and that's um, put us uh, right uh, on, uh, on the topic. So now we're heading towards the main outcomes of the Ministerial Forum for the Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific from His Excellency Christophe Penot. French Ambassador for Indo-Pacific, and His Excellency Gabriele Vizantin, Special Envoy for the European Union for Indo-Pacific. Uh, Ambassador Penault, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to you all, Sawadikap. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, have been invited to deliver these uh, opening remarks. And uh, I was asked to cover the uh, Paris Ministerial Forum, which was organized on the 22nd of February, co-organized by the French EU Presidency of the Council and the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Uh, this forum came exactly um, six months after the publication of the EU strategy, and it was intended as a clear demonstration of the EU commitment to the region. So what were the main takeaways? Uh, first of all, the, the forum was successful because it was the first meeting of its kind between the EU and Indo-Pacific countries and at this level. We had a very good turnout from both sides, bringing together about 60 participants a um, great majority of them were ministers, uh, representatives from the EU institutions, but also regional organizations from both the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. A special attention was given to the participation of ASEAN countries with Cambodia, uh, the ASEAN chair, and Indonesia, the G20 chair, speaking at the opening plenary session. I think we fulfilled our two main objectives, which were number one, to reaffirm the importance of the Indo-Pacific for the EU 
as well as the increased and long-term engagement of the EU and its member states through concrete actions. And number two, uh, during the three round tables, which were held during this ministerial forum, we were able to discuss together and identify concrete actions which would give more flesh to the EU strategy. And I shall give some examples of that later on. And also, uh, I should say that with this forum, we have moved forward in building a common vision of the Indo-Pacific, which is based on very strong areas of convergence regarding, in particular, our uh, common support to strengthening multilateralism and the rule of law and to promote peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific and also our strong support to a sustainable and inclusive development and our shared concern to escape from the trap of dependency. Also our agreement on the need to develop a non-confrontational approach as opposed to a bipolar block type approach. And lastly, our agreement on the need for a multi-dimensional approach with a strong priority given to concrete solutions in order to tackle global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity, oceans protection, health, and sustainable developments. So to be more uh, concrete, let me give you um, a, a couple of examples um, which were um, of, of issues and, and decisions we were taken during the um, three roundtables. The, the first roundtable was on connectivity and, and digital economy. Um, we could, uh, during this discussion, uh, highlight the importance of the EU's global gateway strategy, which is a project uh, offer for uh, sustainable and inclusive connectivity. And the EU uh, commissioner um, was able to announce 2.3 billion euros, uh, which are committed to the Indo-Pacific in the next uh, three years, under this uh, new initiative of Global Gateway. Number two uh, example, uh, France, Italy and Germany, along with the EU, have pledged support for the preparation of a Team Europe initiative bringing together uh, member states uh, and the Commission to promote sustainable connectivity between the EU and ASEAN and within ASEAN in the fields of uh, transport, uh, energy, uh, digital technology, and also by strengthening mobility and people to people exchange. And one last example is the, uh, the launching of negotiations for the EU's digital partnership with South Korea, Japan, and Singapore. These partnerships will include a uh, focus on, on the main uh, issues uh, that we discussed in Paris, which are secure and sustainable digital infrastructure, uh, skills development, digital transformation and business, and digitization of public services. Then I come to the second round table, which uh, was on uh, global challenges. Um, it was announced uh, that the EU would top up its contribution to the Kiwa Initiative for climate change adaptation and biodiversity protection in the Pacific. Uh, this initiative was launched by France, the uh, Agence Française de Développement and the European Union. And it brings together um, some of our partners in the Indo-Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, and, and Canada. There was also a very strong support which was expressed for the EU ASEAN Green Team Europe Initiative. It reflects uh, Europe's desire to strengthen its partnership with the region in areas such as climate action, um, transition to clean energy and disaster resilience, for instance, but also uh, food systems and uh, illegal logging. 
as part of the initiative, the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility provides uh, blended investment funds and technical assistance for green infrastructure projects in the region. Um, let me take a, a few examples before I conclude uh, regarding the third round table, which, was, uh, uh, which focused on security and defense. There were essentially uh, three uh, issues and, and, and actions which were discussed. The first one is the extension of the concept of coordinated maritime presence in the Northwestern Ocean, Indian Ocean. Uh, extension because we have uh, already uh, carried out an experiment in the Gulf of Guinea. So this concept of coordinated maritime presence will ensure a significant by enhancing coordination between member states deployments and also facilitating information sharing and also cooperation with uh, countries of the region. And then we discussed also two um, um, EU initiatives, which are very important in the field of security and defense. Um, the first one is SEWA, enhancing security in and with Asia. And the other one is uh, Primario 2, the critical maritime routes Indo-Pacific project for the Pacific, uh, which will be an extension of the uh, present program. It's a capacity building uh, project for, for maritime domain awareness. So, uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, in our view, the forum was a, a very uh, important staging post, which also helped uh, reinforce the um, strategic focus of the EU on the Indo-Pacific, and that it's created also a very good momentum. And to um, echo what uh, Thier Ambassador Thierry Matou has just said, let me add one last conclusive remark. Uh, ASEAN represents a key partner and an essential pillar of the French uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, we firmly believe in the centrality of ASEAN and fully support, of course, ASEAN's commitment to building a regional security architecture. Um, and lastly, we strongly support, of course, the reinforcement of the strategic partnership between the EU and ASEAN which will be an essential component of the implementation of the EU strategy. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, His Excellency uh, Christophe Penot. Uh, His Excellency Gabriel Evzentin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to, to, to everybody. Thank you very much, above all, to the to the French Embassy and uh, above all to uh, Ambassador Matteu for uh, for this uh, uh, very timely and very important initiative. Thanks, of course, to Ambassador Daly for uh, being there and introducing me kindly. Uh, so uh, I would like just to build on what was said uh, without without repeating uh, what I heard. Uh, of course, uh, as Ambassador Matteu. Matthew, uh, an opening, in his openings uh, uh, reminded us uh, there is a geopolitical situation uh, created after the uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, war. Uh, so there is a pre and a post uh, situation which has changed the uh, geopolitical uh, interest and, uh, and uh, uh, balances. Now, um, this has even increased the resolve of the EU to be present, active in the Indo-Pacific. It, it, it doesn't have, uh, it has not reduced, but it has increased the need to be present and to be uh, uh, credibly defending the international rules-based order and the multilateral. Um, and I will uh, then build on uh, uh, connecting on what uh, Ambassador Penault said on the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Forum, Ministerial Forum of Paris. 
totally agree with a very important uh, outcome and the fact that only uh, this, this meeting was the first of its kind and this was already a political result. But I would like to underline that um, on the same day of the Indo-Pacific Forum, on the 22nd of February, the EU and the French presidency had in the morning a ministerial meeting on Indo-Pacific and in the afternoon in Paris, in the same premise, uh, uh, extraordinary foreign affairs uh, ministers meeting on Ukraine. And I think this gives the uh, visual image of the fact that the EU is a geopolitical actor and can play uh, geopolitically on about its uh, interest and acting all over the world. So uh, the Paris Forum was very important because it could deal in the same day, the EU dealt in the same day at ministerial level, both on Indo-Pacific and on the Ukraine crisis. Second uh, point, uh, I would like to thank the French uh, presidency for uh, having uh, launched this uh, Paris Forum, because as the Minister Ledrian said, in closing the Paris Forum, he said that this could become une méthode de travail, a working method for the future. This means that uh, future presidencies, of course, with the support and the total involvement of the EU and the EAS and the High Representative, uh, might wish to organize other ministerial fora, which would then uh, uh, build on what has happened in France in February. So we are really looking forward at organizing, if not regularly, at least uh, uh, consequently, uh, other uh, ministerial fora, which would keep the momentum of uh, uh, the interest of the Union on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so I will then uh, not repeat uh, all has been said about the, the EU's engagement with the Indo-Pacific. It has uh, very, very eloquently said by, the, by Ambassador Mathieu in his openings. Uh, all which is behind the uh, EU's uh, setting up its, uh, its engagement with the, with the region. Uh, so I would uh, just uh, attach um, the interest of the EU to the multilateral and regional cooperation uh, starting from where uh, Ambassador Penault left it, namely on ASEAN. Um, the EU agreed on a on uh, um, lifting up its partnership with ASEAN to a strategic level back in December 2020. So we are we consider now ASEAN as a strategic partner of the EU, and it's the only international organization that the EU has as a strategic partner. Um, and I would like to underline that the ASEAN Charter cites uh, adhering to the principles of democracy, the rule of law, and good governance respect for and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms as a basic precept in its preamble. And this resonates very, very loud and clear uh, in the uh, light of what is happening in Europe and in the light of the uh, Ukraine uh, war. And this uh, makes it even clearer the link that the EU has with ASEAN. In ASEAN, uh, there are centered, uh, uh, there are organizations uh, guiding security cooperation, which includes, uh, of course, the ASEAN Regional Forum, of which the EU is an active member. So the Indo-Pacific region is the present, is the future, but insecurity and tensions are rising there as well. The key point uh, to make here today, I think, is that economic growth of this region rests on openness, on stable and shared rules and shared security. And the EU's interest is precisely this, that the regional order stays open and rules-based. We can contribute a lot, uh, which is recognized by our regional partners who view the EU as a trusted and reliable actor. The EU wants to expand engagement with this region which is why, as reminded, the HRVP and the Commission uh, adopted 
the uh, EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. After <clears throat> France and other member states had already done so at national level. But the way the EU's approach is very close to ASEAN's own outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Concretely, we will advance joint work to boost trade and investment, economic openness, and sustainable approach to connectivity. We will promote multilateral cooperation, working on global challenges, from pandemic to climate, from ocean governance to digital. And we will deepen our security engagement, seeking to make that cooperation as concrete as possible. Our new strategy, our new, our recently adopted strategy, aims to deepen regional integration and is inclusive of all our partners in the region, wishing to cooperate with the EU when our interests coincide. And this includes China, because we know that in important areas like climate, fisheries, biodiversity, cooperation with China is essential. We do not aim to create blocks or force countries to take sides. And we want to deepen our cooperation with democratic like-minded partners. The European Union's commitment to democratic right, democracy and fundamental freedom is very strong. Not because we see these as European or Western constructs, but because these values and principles are universal. And many countries and certainly the people in this region share our view. They want to determine their political future and their rights protected. ASEAN is at the heart of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy. While we will also develop closer relations with other regional organizations in the Indian and Pacific Ocean. We have long been ASEAN's number one development partner, but are also its third trade partner and third investor. Our exports to ASEAN countries grew from 54 billion in 2010 to 85 billion in 2019, and imports from ASEAN countries grew even more, from 72 billion in 2019 to 125 billion. By 2050, ASEAN is set to be the world's fourth largest economy. So the EU-ASEAN strategic partnership is a sign that both, both sides want to scale up and redirect their cooperation. Not just work on trade, investment, and sustainable development, although they matter, but also on strategic issues. To give just one example, and which is very much in line of our uh, workshop today, let's take maritime security. First of all, regional security is very much on top of our mind. Also because around 40%, 40% of the EU's foreign trade passes through the South China Sea making stability in the region a shared concern and area for cooperation. For many years, we have had a dedicated dialogue on maritime security cooperation where the EU and ASEAN share best practices and lessons learned. We are exploring options on how to enhance EU's maritime presence in the Indo-Pacific space. And the coordinated maritime presence mentioned by Ambassador Penault is an obvious uh, example and evidence of this. So like ASEAN, the EU is committed to secure, free, and open maritime supply routes in the South and East China Sea in full compliance with international law, in particular, the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas. We support the ASEAN-led process towards an effective and legally binding code of conduct for the South China Sea. We should not prejudice the interests of third parties. Connectivity is another major plank of our Indo-Pacific strategy. And we favor a sustainable and rules-based approach to connectivity built around transparency, local ownership, and environmental sustainability. So I will conclude, and I hope I did not take too much of your time, uh, underlining the need for the EU to engage more in and with the Indo-Pacific, clearly. Working together on shared security, sustainable connectivity, and global challenges. The EU, the Indo-Pacific countries, and ASEAN are natural partners. So let's continue to put this partnership to work, 
for regional and global stability and progress and for our mutual benefit. Thank you very much. His Excellency Gabriel Vizantin, um, thank you a lot for, for your speech.